Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. I've been asked to uh, to let everybody know that we have to be out of here at 11.55. There's another group coming in, so uh, David will remind us uh, toward the end. I've always thought it would be a lot of fun to introduce a speaker by standing up and saying, and now here's someone who needs no introduction, and then just sit down. <laughs> that would deprive me of an opportunity, though, and that's to thank David for the many things he has done for First Iliad and then Osher over the years. He's been an extraordinary study leader, uh, more of an impresario in, in many ways. Uh, if those who remember the Vienna Night, which was an extraordinary thing that we did at Spalding. Uh, David was one of the founders of the Summer Lecture Series and uh, did that for a number of years. It's still going strong after 20 some years, and I'm not sure exactly how many. Uh, I thought David had been doing this for 30 years, but we just figured out that it's only 29. <laughs> so without, uh, just other than our, our gratitude, thank you so much, David Bisno. Thank you, Steve. Is the volume okay? Can you all hear? <clears throat> Great. Uh, well, welcome. I'm pleased to see all of you and to once again have a face-to-face -face audience, uh, a group of students. Uh, I think it's really important to be able to look each other in the eye, know where we are, and, and, and uh, share stories together. <clears throat> this presentation, this story, came about, occurred to me, last March when Vladimir Putin was, and since then, been forced into a corner, or so it seems when you read the newspapers in Moscow. And uh, one wonders what this Vladimir Putin would do if he were forced into a corner, which he feel progressively may be the case, and the threat of using one type or another of nuclear weapon which would be, as you know, a disaster for the world. And as I've read, the State Department is mightily concerned what the US response would be if he were to use even one nuclear weapon. And those who have come back from Europe are particularly concerned of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, which would be a walkover, including the fact that um, Finland and Sweden all of a sudden join NATO because they're frightened also of the possibility of Russia and their leader being unhinged. So it occurred to me that with the world situation as it is, if we were to face this disaster, which would be the, the largest disaster ever, at least my Iliad Osher students should know the origins the story of how this all came about. <laughs> and at the end of this presentation of sharing Lisa Meitner's story with you, I'm going to tell you the Dartmouth story of how I first learned this whole story, which is very, very much a Dartmouth Hanover story. So it, it, it's, a, it's a circle story. So let me, let me start and share uh, the story with you and you now appreciate why I wanted to do this story at this time um, <clears throat> with you. The story starts and ends with Lisa Meitner, who was born in 1878 in Vienna to a liberal Jewish family, although not particularly observant. Her father was an attorney, a free thinker, and she was the third of eight children, uh, all of whom grew up in uh, Vienna. Like Gustav Mahler and many others in Vienna, those who were educated in professions found it uh, more convenient to not be Jewish. And so Lisa Meitner, at age 30, gave up being Jewish and converted, unlike many others, she converted to Protestantism, not Catholicism. So Judaism was gone, 
And it was in this milieu in Fantasy Acla Vienna that Lisa was born and educated. This was a city at the time, the turn of the century, when there were artists that you know of in Vienna, although Lisa was not posing or sleeping with Gustav Klimt. <laughs> it was a city of renowned physicians, although Lisa did not need to see a physician, uh, but would serve as a nurse in World War I. Landsteiner, Semmelweis, Freud were the most famous of the physicians in the city at the time. And there, and there were writers of whom the world admired. <coughs> uh, Lisa shared neither the romance of which Schnitzler wrote, nor was involved in the hypocrisies of which Stefan Zweig depicted in his short stories and Karl Kraus in his satires. And the city was full of musicians. Lisa shared neither the romances <coughs> of which Schnitzler wrote, but she did like the music in Vienna. She was all part of that, but she was a serious science student, but she would continue her interest in music in Berlin in later years. She attended the University of Vienna <coughs> because at that time, Austrian public education for women ended at age 14. So either your family had enough money to send their daughter to a private school, or their education was finished at 14. In 1897, the University of Vienna was open to women, and Lisa Meitner was the second woman to earn a PhD in physics at the University of Vienna. The person under whom she studied and admired greatly was a well-known scientist at the time, Professor Ludwig Boltzmann, whose a uh, guiding principle which he imparted to Lisa was that physics is a battle for ultimate truth of how our world is put together and how it works. And that is your obligation as a physicist to learn how our world is put together and how it works. Lisa was aware, notice the years, 1901 to 1906, this is really critical. During those years, although 500 miles away in Bern, Switzerland, was a young man in a patent office who in 1905 published the special theory of relativity. She was aware of that. In Bern, 500 miles away, and he published this most famous of all equations. I was trying to think, what other equation is as famous as E equals MC squared? Well, I think probably A squared plus B squared equals C squared. <laughs> That's probably as, as famous. Uh, but she was aware of this finding by Albert Einstein, which essentially said that the energy within an atom is held together, holds together the parts of the atom. Now, important in that equation, which she noted, was C. C stands for the speed of light. It's a big number. And it was first discovered by a Dane by the name of Ole Romer in 1676 that the speed of light is approximately 186,000 miles per second. That is how fast a light ray travels. It's really fast. So when you slip, flip on the switch in your room, the light goes across the room at the rate of 186,000 miles per second. And you'll notice that in his formula is the speed of light, c, and it's multiplied times itself c squared. So you have, if you want to use miles and seconds, 186,000 miles per second squared times itself. So c is a really, really big number of which Lisa was aware as a student in Vienna. Now at the time, <coughs> a young woman by the name of Maria Skadowska was born actually <coughs> exactly 
11 years prior to Lisa, on November 7, 1867. Marie Curie, that would be her name, was the first of six children born to liberal parents uh, in Poland. Her mother and older sister died early. Her father was an early teacher. They were oppressed, as the Ukraine is now, by Russia. They controlled Poland, and so she fled where the universities were absolutely closed to women. She fled to Paris. By 1903, working with radioactive elements, Marie Curie earned a the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1903. Keep in mind, Lisa is in Vienna working towards her PhD in physics at the time that she sees Marie Curie over in Paris earn a Nobel Prize in the area in which Lisa was interested. Now, at this point, I need to stop the story and be sure we understand a little bit about the building blocks of our universe. And I do this with just a little bit of trepidation because a couple of you mentioned to me that you weren't going to come to the lecture today because you thought it would be too full of science. And that wasn't, that wasn't so comfortable. But I got to do this because you got to understand <laughs> what's going on. And so I'm going to try to make this as very, very simple as possible. So let's jump in because this is what it's really all about. What is an element? What is an element? An element, like copper, tin, iron, neon, argon, carbon. We all know those names of things. Those things that we toss around, I want a tin frying pan. I want an iron skillet. Those things are all elements. And there are more than uh, over 100 known substances that we consider elements. And what makes something an element? An element is something that uh, cannot be broken down into, similar, in, into other substances. It is what it is, and it, they are the primary constituents of all matter in the universe. Those are elements. And copper, iron, zinc, you can go on and name those with which we're familiar. So they're basic elements. You can't break them down. OK. If you take a, a log, which is a piece of wood, and you burn it, you get carbon dioxide. You get heat. But you don't have another element. It's still carbon or carbon dioxide going up in the air. And ashes, that's still carbon. C carbon doesn't disappear. Chemically, it changes its format into, into carbon dioxide and ashes, as an example. So what is an atom? An atom is the smallest unit of a chemical element. So if I give you a, a pan of copper, a copper frying pan, that is made up of atoms of copper. Atoms are the smallest particle that you can break down. Any element is made up of atoms. And then what is a molecule? A molecule is a chemical combination of two or more elements. And when you put two together, chemically. And the easiest, most obvious example of that is water. Lots of water around us. When you turn on the foot, water comes out. Those are molecules. And molecules are a chemical combination of two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen. And we call that H2O. So those are the, the building blocks of which our universe is made. Now, what defines an element? Let's be more specific and define what defines copper. Why is it copper? Or why is it lead? So let's look at an atom. An atom, what it makes up an atom? 
Now stay with me. We're going to do this slowly. Now if you have questions, stop me right now. It's better we do it now because we won't be able to do it later. An atom has in its center, which we call a nucleus, neutrons and protons. And whirling around the outside are electrons. Forget about the electrons and just look in the center of each atom are made of neutrons and protons. And scientists signify how many of each by an atomic number and an atomic weight. <clears throat> the atomic number is simply the number of protons. Just count the number of protons, and that's the atomic number. The atomic weight is simply adding the number of protons and neutrons together, and we call that the atomic weight. That's by convention. It's not from the Talmud or from God. That's just how it has uh, developed uh, in, in physics. Now. The atom, being made up of protons and neutrons, it turns out that the number of protons determines what element it is. Forget everything else. The number of protons in the atom of an element determines what it is. That makes it lead, or makes it copper, or makes it tin or makes it oxygen, simply determined by the number of protons in the nucleus. The number of protons, which element? So as an example, let's take the easiest, simplest hydrogen. Hydrogen has one proton. That makes it, that's hydrogen. That's all there is to it, all right? And there was made up an array of how do we symbolize all of these in a chart. And so don't worry about the shape of the chart. Don't let this throw you. Just forget about it. Except that it's arranged 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 in order, horizontally across. Hydrogen in the upper left has one proton, so therefore it's first. Now let's look at helium. helium has two protons. Uh, an atom, an element with two protons, is helium. It acts differently. It has different properties than uh, hydrogen. And in the chart, helium, you see, is in the upper right because it's number two. And then we go back. Don't worry about how they're arranged, except that they are arranged across one, two, three, four, horizontally from left to right across. So let's take another one, which we breathe every second of our life as oxygen. The only difference between oxygen and hydrogen or copper is the number of protons in the nucleus of the atom. And in oxygen, there are eight protons. It turns out there are eight neutrons for a total weight of 16. But what concerns us is the number of protons. And that makes it oxygen. And so in the chart, 1, 2, 3 across to 8 is oxygen. Any questions up to this point? Yes. Yes. Betsy? Okay. Please. Take your mask off. I can't hear you otherwise. Sure. Where can we go? Can we go back one slide? With, on your, to your graphic? Yeah. So is an ion a No, I'm not going to go into that. We're not talking about ions. What are they? We're not talking about ions. OK. OK, Tom? <laughs> now, who came up with all these uh, dyslexicons? <laughs> what, uh, what, human being, what human being did this? Uh, the chart was made, worked out, by a Russian by the name of Mendeleev. That's a whole other story. And the discovery of different elements is part of the story I'm going to share with you today. But Priestley discovered oxygen. Someone else discovered this. Someone else discovered that. And Marie Curie discovered other elements for which she won the Nobel Prize. OK. So, um, so if the number of protons determines which element, what do neutrons determine? Protons determine which element. What do neutrons determine? 
You've heard the term isotope. An isotope is an, that atom which may have one or more or one or more fewer neutrons than its cousin. They're all that element, whatever that element is. But if you add neutrons or subtract neutrons, it doesn't change the element, but those are isotopes. They're cousins. But it's still iron or copper or whatever you say. And so to summarize that, adding or subtracting neutrons determines the isotope of the element. So the atomic weight is the sum of protons and neutrons reflecting the element. That's the number of protons. And the number of neutrons determines a cousin, an isotope of the element. Any questions on that? OK, so let's take the next step and give you an example. Let's talk about carbon. Carbon has six protons. That's what makes it carbon, six protons in the nucleus. And it has six neutrons in the nucleus. That's carbon. However, it is possible, and it sits there in the chart number six, carbon, which we use every day in our life. Now let's play with this and see what we can do to carbon. It has six neutrons in the nucleus. But we can add neutrons. In the physics laboratory, you can send neutrons into a substance. And they do it right here in, in the physics lab, right, right here at Dartmouth. And so we can send one neutron in, and we can send another neutron in. Now, it's still carbon, but we've made an isotope of carbon, of carbon-6. And so by adding two neutrons, we change the number you see. The weight changes to 14. And we now have what is referred to as an unstable atom. It has too many neutrons to be stable. Something's going to happen to that atom. It can't stay like that. It's uncomfortable. It's unstable. It wants to get rid of some of those particles. And so what happens is that that substance, carbon-14, as we refer to it, is what we call radioactive. We use these terms, but we're not sure what we're talking about. What it means is that piece of carbon that's sitting on the desk, carbon-14, isn't going to stay as carbon-14 because it's, quote, radioactive and is sending out those neutrons are, go are going to leave because it's unstable. And when they leave, they take energy or radiation. And that is what we call it's radioactive. And that will make you very sick. Marie Curie died because she worked with these elements that were, quote, radioactive. And back then, they had no idea how dangerous they were to someone's health. Thus, all the concern for what's happening in Ukraine with the nuclear reactor because of radiation and the un instability or instability of, of uh, radioactive atoms. Now, when Lisa finished and graduated as the second woman in Vienna to ever graduate with a physics degree, she knew about Marie Curie. She was a woman. And she was working in the same area as Lisa. And who else with whom to study but to go to Paris and do her postdoctoral work with a woman, totally unusual, who had won a Nobel Prize in the same area that Lisa was involved in. So she applied to Marie Curie to, to move to Paris and study with her. She was refused. We don't know the reasons, but she was refused. And so the second best choice would be to go to Berlin and study essentially with the father of quantum mechanics, a good Prussian by the name of Max Planck, who was essentially the father of quantum mechanics. And he accepted her, but had no salary for her and no official position, but you can come. Lisa, it was an opportunity. And her father said, he had plenty of money. He said, Lisa, I will pay for you 
to go to Berlin, and I will pay you whatever you need to live and work with Max Planck. What a privilege. So Lisa moves to Berlin and into the institute where Max Planck is doing essentially much of the same thing. After Lisa is in Berlin with Max Planck at the Wilhelm Institute, Marie Curie in Paris continues to be productive. Her name changes when she gets married. And with her husband, she discovers three new elements never discovered before, never known or found before, polonium, radium, and thorium. And each of these elements that she discovers are radioactive. Each of them is radioactive, which means they send out energy. They're sending out neutrons. Their remaining is polonium. Their remaining is radium. Their remaining is thorium. But they're sending out neutrons with energy. And if you remember back some years ago when we went out and bought a, a Seiko wristwatch, and we wanted one that glows in the dark, Wow, I can look at my watch in the dark. Yeah, you're receiving radium rays. Because the tiny little bit of radium was painted onto the numerals on your watch dial. And what makes them glow in the dark? Radiation, radiating out from the element that Marie Curie had discovered in Paris for which she won a second Nobel Prize in 1911. So Marie Curie had won a Nobel Prize in physics, and she had won a Nobel Prize in chemistry. And all of this was being observed by poor, essentially indigent, but supported by her wealthy father in Berlin, who did not have a real position, but was at the Institute. And she was at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin with a young chemist by the name of Otto Hahn. Otto Hahn was as German and Prussian as you could be, and he was extremely bright. He was a chemist, not a physicist. And he welcomed Marie, uh, no, no, sorry, he welcomed Lisa Meitner into his lab, and they would work together for 31 years, from 1907 to 1938. And they were a good couple, because she would do the physics, and he would do the chemistry. And the chemistry means you separate. You, you pour fluids, et cetera, et cetera. You do the chemistry, and she figures out the theory of what's going on with the atoms and the protons. That wasn't his, he, that wasn't his field. He was mixing things and separating substances that they found and so they were a perfect, perfect team. She took leave in 1915 when she was 37 years old. She was at age 30. She had dropped her Judaism and converted to Protestantism. And seven years later, when she was 37 during the First World War, she was Austrian. She was Austrian through and through and grateful to her dad, wealthy, who was in Vienna. And so she left the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and did what <coughs> seemed easy and natural for her. She uh, became a nurse, but an x-ray technician. And that would be appropriate for someone who understood uh, the, the physics. OK, so she's there, and uh, she spent, uh, what, a little over a year as a nurse working with the Austrians and the Germans in the First World War. She came back to Berlin, and through the years, working with Otto Hahn, they decided to find a missing element. And the missing element that they wanted to find was one proton less than uranium. Uranium was 90, number 92, which means it has 92 protons. That's what makes it uranium. And the element with 89 protons, or I'm sorry, 91 protons, 
had never been found. And they determined they would try to find it. This is what physics and chemistry was about in those days. And they were successful. And they uh, discovered a new element for which they were looking, number 91, which they called proactinium. So that was a major discovery. And some years later, Lisa was honored when uh, another element was found. Uh, this is years later. She didn't find it. But they didn't know what to call this new element. And so they called it mitnerium, in honor of Lisa Meitner. So she essentially had credit for, with Otto Hahn, discovering uh, proactinium. And she was honored with the name mitnerium. But she didn't have anything to do with finding that. So now let's go back and ask, what is a radioactive element? It means when an element is radioactive, which you hear all the time, what that means, it has too many neutrons and protons for stability. It cannot sit there on your shelf, and you come back some time later, and it's still there. It's going to coat decay. And how does something decay? It's not because worms get into it or because a mold gets into it and spoils like a piece of meat. What it means in decay is that neutrons, if not protons, escape because the nucleus is unstable. That's what it means. And so now let's take a look at uranium. Uranium is no different than copper or lead or tin, except for the number of protons. That's all that makes the difference between oxygen and tin and copper and uranium, is the number of protons in the nucleus. So let's look at uranium. And what does uranium look like? I suspect most of us have never seen a piece, and we never held a piece. But it's real stuff. Here is someone holding a hunk of uranium. It's real. And you can mine it and bring it up out of the ground. OK, so uranium has 92 protons. That makes it uranium. But uranium has some cousins. And when you go digging for uranium, it turns out that 99.3% of the uranium you pull out of the ground has 92 protons as uranium, but it has 146 neutrons. But 0.72% of the uranium, a tiny little bit, among all this uranium, if you try to separate them, which is done, you get U-235, uranium-235, which means it has three less neutrons than 99% of the uranium. And that's very special. And when you hear about the centrifuges, remember, you know, people centrifuges in these reactors and so forth, what they are doing is spinning down the uranium to get that tiny little bit, because that's what's needed. And we'll see why. But that's what's needed, that tiny little bit of uranium, which has 143 neutrons rather than 146. And why is that important? Because U-235, with few, three fewer <coughs> neutrons, is unstable. That means it's going to blow apart. By blowing apart, it means neutrons are going to leave, or protons are going to leave. It, it's too much for the atom to stay in one piece, so to speak. So how does this happen? What happens? When U-235 changes, it can happen in two ways. It, the first way is called an alpha ray comes out of it, which means the two protons and two neutrons leave. And that's called an alpha ray. When two, atom, two neutrons and two protons leave the piece of uranium, that's called an alpha ray. But that's what it is, two protons and two neutrons. 
But what's important for you to see is that two protons leave. And in the chart, we now have 90 protons rather than 92, 141 neutrons. The number of protons goes down by two. The weight changes. And now it is no longer uranium. Why isn't it uranium? Because why isn't it uranium? Because two protons have left. Two protons have left. And so it's not uranium anymore. It goes down the chart by two. Uranium lost two protons just sitting on your desk, and it goes down to thorium, up two steps down. And it is no longer uranium. It is thorium which has, instead of 92 protons, 90. But there's another possibility. That uranium, 239 in this case, can send out beta rays. And what's a beta ray? A beta ray is the loss of a neutron and an electron, and it adds a proton. Don't worry about the details of this, but the, but the point is that the, that the element moves up one, up one. And so now it is neptunium. And that's what will happen if you put a piece of uranium on the desk. It will either, or both, disintegrate to thorium down two, or up one to neptunium. And that was the gospel. That's what every physicist around the world understood happens in these nuclear reactions. This is an atomic reaction a naturally occurring reaction that when it disintegrates, <clears throat> uranium goes down two or up one. Yeah, you've got a question over here. Uh, uh, yes, I'm sorry. Are there neutrons and protons just floating around on their own? No. Where do, where do they get the extra neutrons from? Or where do the excess ones go? The question is, from where do the extra neutrons come? And where do they go? OK, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not a physicist. I'm try to, try to be a historian. But I can tell you, and I, I, I can only tell you so much, Lori. But at the physics lab here, when I did this class 15 years ago, one of the physicists here had a, call it a gun. Well, it wasn't really a gun. But some device which sent out neutrons. And he, he bombarded some atoms of an element, and he had a Geiger counter. And Geiger counter registers the radiation coming out. And you shoot, the neutrons come out, and it causes the element to, into which the neutrons were shot to become unstable, and out comes radiation. The details of how you do that, or what it, I, I don't know. I used to know how to remove cataracts. I don't, don't know how to <laughs> shoot, shoot, shoot neutrons. But what I, what I want you to appreciate is that it was the gospel that a radioactive element in disintegration can go down two or up one in a naturally occurring situation. That was it. That was how things worked. OK, so <clears throat> an unstable nucleus. This simply summarizes that this is what we got to know, and what Lisa Meitner knew, what Marie Curie knew, what Max Planck knew, they all knew this as the way the world functions. This was it. OK. And so in summary again, if uranium is going to disintegrate, it's going to either go down two or up one. OK. Now, what's really happening here? What's happening is an element is changing into something else. Well, that was the holy grail all through medieval and modern history, that people wanted to take tin and turn it into gold. Wow, wouldn't that be cool? If we could go in the back room and do whatever you do, mix it together, hammer it, do something, and instead of tin, you have gold. Well, we'd, that would be cool. And so it was depicted 
in many, many ways. You know, magic brews, Aladdin and his lamp, all kinds of, 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 of fairy tales, of mysteries, but it was real that people really spent their life trying to cook up a brew. All of this was called alchemy, which was considered nonsense. You can't take tin and turn it into gold. There were, it was depicted in many stories, in, 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 in some of it real history, that people spent their lives trying to change the stories are tin into gold. That would be cool if you could do that. And none other than Sir Isaac Newton, after he wrote his Principia in 1687 and became the most famous scientist in the world at the time and the most ph phenomenal book ever written, turned his life to alchemy. That is remarkable, that someone who understood all the laws of physics thought that there might be a way of changing one element into another, practicing alchemy. And he did that. And that is, in fact, what Lisa Meitner accomplished. And that's the story of um, the story of turning one element into another. And you see it happens naturally. Uranium, take a hunk of uranium and sit there. It will perform its own alchemy and turn into thorium or turn into neptunium. And you don't have uranium anymore. It's turned into a, to a different element. Now, while this was going on, down in Rome, a name with which most of us are familiar was that of Enrico Fermi. Enrico Fermi was a physicist working in Rome on exactly the same questions and on exactly the same problems as those with which Marie Curie in Paris and Lisa Meitner and her partner Otto Hahn were working on every day in Berlin. Enrico Fermi did this between 1936 and 1934 in Rome. But in 1933, Adolf Hitler comes to power in Germany. And everything would change. Enrico Fermi, the following year after Adolf Hitler comes to power, he decides to bombard uranium with a neutron. And he does so. And two new substances are produced. Unknown X, and it deteriorates into something we'll call Y. But this is the example of now <coughs> two steps up. 92 to 93, and 93 goes one, it goes each one was a separate step. 92 goes to 93, and then 93 deteriorates to 94. He wasn't sure what to call them, but he thought he had them. 90, 93 and 94 elements that should be put in the periodic chart that he had found. But he wasn't sure their properties. He wasn't sure what to call them. But this is the equation. This is the work that he did and produced these two new substances in 1934. His claim in 1934 is shown in the chart here, that with uranium, he produced neptunium and he produced plutonium by bombarding uranium with neutrons. That's what he thought he produced. And he published it and claimed that as a uh, his own. Back in Berlin, Lisa Meitner and Otto Hahn every day worked together uh, trying to work out the chemistry, the physics, in particular, of uranium. March 12, 1938 is the Anschluss. Adolf Hitler and the German troops 
march into Austria and were actually welcomed on the Ringstrasse. And thousands of Viennese turned out to welcome Adolf Hitler and the Nazis into Vienna. And just as Vladimir Putin today is claiming to annex parts of the Ukraine as Russian territory, in one sweep of the pen, I guess, Adolf Hitler declares that all of Austria is now Germany. It's all German, and all Austrian citizens are now German citizens, just as Putin is today doing in the Ukraine. Lisa Meitner is Austrian. She was Jewish. There's a big problem in Berlin, a big problem for Lisa Meitner, because she knows she was Jewish, and Otto Hahn knows she was Jewish. They all knew she was Jewish, although she would sit at the, uh, beside Max Planck in his home and listen as everyone played the piano and had musical salons in the evening, the music she appreciated from Vienna. But life wasn't the same anymore because now the Nazis controlled the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and Lisa Meitner's life was in danger. So I think I'm going to stop at this point. Let's have a break. I know it's been a lot of protons for you to digest. <laughs> Uh, but as you have a cup of coffee and a little snack outside, uh, just remember the one thing David and Faye want you to remember. Up one or down two, right? That's how the world works, either down two or up one. And that's what we got to remember. Let's have a cup of coffee and be back in 15 minutes or so. I so appreciate your showing up on a Saturday morning. It feels particularly good for me. I haven't faced a live audience in Hanover for almost three years. I don't like doing Zoom. I want to see your f expressions. I want to feel the pulse. I can't do that on TV or on a screen. I tried one lecture. I'm looking at the audience. Somebody's brushing their teeth, and someone else is petting, <laughs> petting their dog, and someone else drinking a Coca-Cola, and I said, forget it. Uh, and, and I've told Faye over and over, if it's fun, I'll do it. And since none of us get paid to do this teaching, if it's not fun, I don't do it. And I like interaction and feeling the pulse and trying to be aware of anybody who starts nodding off. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, so I also appreciate being on the Dartmouth campus. I really, really am happy to teach at Dartmouth, not above a pizza parlor. And that's my own feeling, and I think it's important to be on the Dartmouth campus. Um, <clears throat> and I appreciate your masks, unmasks. I, I understand all of our apprehension, and none of us want to get sick. <clears throat> so uh, having said that, let me mention a question or two that people have asked me during the break, one of which is, why uranium? And I probably failed to mention that uranium is that element with the most protons. How many? 92. Come on, 92. Come on, folks, 92. That's really important to know. Don't go home and say you don't know how many protons uranium has after David's lecture. 92. It turns out that there is no element lying around on the Earth that has more protons than uranium. It is, quote, the heaviest in terms of protons element that we know of. Others have been discovered or created as Enrico Fermi thinks, thought he did in Rome, that are heavier, but they're not occurring naturally. They're produced in a laboratory or in a cyclotron. And you wondered, if someone asked me, well, who shoots these neutrons and where do they come from, et cetera? Well, this is the kind of stuff without be becoming technical, because I can't be technical. But you read about cyclotrons. Harvard and MIT share a cyclotron. There's none, as far as I know, up here at Dartmouth. There certainly is the big one outside of Geneva, Switzerland, the CERN 
uh, really big ones. And what they're doing is speeding up neutrons. And their neutrons are going faster and faster and faster and faster, and then whew, shoot it at some substance and see what happens. So as far as I know, I could be corrected, but as far as I know, neutrons leave elements. They do not naturally come into elements. That's an artificial process. Someone asked me that. Now, before I go on, I want to ask Kate Hewitt, are we OK, Kate, with science explanations? Or David, I'm so much smarter than I was when I walked in. <laughs> oh, that's a real compliment, because Kate is pretty smart when she first walks in. So thank you for putting up with this, Kate. All right, so now let's go back to Berlin and pick up the story. Lisa and Otto Hahn had worked together for 31 years in the same laboratory. As the years went on, Max Planck realized how valuable she was, how brilliant she was. She was absolutely the equivalent of Marie Curie. She knew Albert Einstein. She knew Max Planck. She knew all the named physicists of the era. She was one of the gang. And she, like Marie Curie, was a woman. And unlike Marie Curie and Otto Hahn, her blood was Jewish. That proved to be a disaster. On June 14, 1938, when the Nazis took over everything in Germany, including the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. So she knew she would have to leave. The question was how quickly before she would be sent to a concentration camp. So plans were hatched with Otto Hahn and with those around her. And she knew other physicists, Niels Bohr in Copenhagen, Mon Zygmunt up in Sweden, physicists in the Netherlands. They were all a club of these physicists working together. And essentially, she was leading them all with studies of uranium. In preparation for leaving, Otto Hahn, a good German, he wasn't going to leave. But he knew his partner of 31 years would have to get out without anybody knowing. And she couldn't withdraw whatever funds she had would weren't much from the bank. That would notify the Nazis immediately. She could hardly go home to her apartment. She had to get out before anybody knew. Otto Hahn went home and retrieved the diamond ring that was his mother's wedding ring that he had inherited when his mother died. And he took the wedding ring, the diamond ring, and gave it to Lisa and said, Lisa, at least you can hide this and take it with you so you have some funds with you on your exit from Germany if you can get through the border guards and get out of Germany. So plans were hatched for Lisa to escape with the one thing that she uh, was given the diamond ring. All her records, all her clothes, all her belongings, she could take nothing. So plans were made through the intraphysics community for her to try to get to the Netherlands by train leaving Berlin at midnight with the diamond ring hidden somewhere in her clothing. And a fellow physicist by the name of Dirk Koster, who was a physicist in the Netherlands, would meet the train. And uh, so she left uh, and fleed by train from Berlin west to the Netherlands. Um, and she crossed at a town called Neue Schwanz. And she was in Groningen, the Netherlands, at 6 PM on July 13th, 1938, having evaded the Nazis, but having taken nothing with her. 
Once in the Netherlands, watch the dates now. Watch the dates carefully. She fled on July 13th. On July 28th, two weeks later, from the Netherlands, she flew to Copenhagen, where her nephew, her very close nephew, was a physicist by the name of Otto Frisch. And he was working in the laboratory of Niels Bohr, who sort of his name is legend. And he uh, was as famous as Max Planck, Marie Curie, running the lab, the nuclear lab in um, Copenhagen. And that is where Lisa Meitner's nephew, also a physicist, was working. So she's now in Copenhagen. And three days later, she leaves Copenhagen because Niels Bohr did not have a position for her in his lab. I don't know the details, but there was no position for her. And so she then went to Stockholm, an easy trip. And she arrived there on August 1st and went to see Mon Zygban, who was another physicist working at a lab in Sweden. Now, just think back. In 1907, when she graduated the University of Vienna, she was an impoverished student. With all, the only money she had from anywhere was the money given to her as an allowance by her dad. 31 years later, in 1938, she was recognized across Europe within the scientific community as a major accomplished European scientist who is now fleeing with 10 marks in her pocketbook. She was stateless. She was Austrian. Austria was now Germany. She would be sent to a concentration camp and killed. She had no home, no position, no income, no passport, only a diamond ring from her Christian German colleague with whom she had worked for 31 years. She had nothing to protect her. She wrote, a past that was gone, a future totally unknown that it might hold nothing for her. She was given no job. She was stateless, pap passportless. Moneyless, alone. Meanwhile, while she's in Stockholm, hoping to be given a lab or some position with this uh, uh, physicist, Mann Siegmann, in Germany, in Berlin, on November 2nd, Hahn decides to follow Lisa's instructions, which he, she had left with him on what he should do in the physics lab. Remember, he's a chemist. But she left instructions of what to do in the physics lab. And her instructions were to bombard two U-235 with neutrons. That's the equation. That's the experiment. That's the procedure that for which she left instructions for her partner, Otto Hahn, to carry out, which he did following her instructions on November 2nd, 1938. Uranium-92 bombarded with a neutron, produced X and then Y plus Z. And he had no idea what the hell he had produced. <coughs> Didn't understand it. Not on so unlike Enrico Fermi had done in 1934 down in, in, in Rome. Otto Hahn, so excited that he might make a breakthrough, and who knows, might win a Nobel Prize, decided, like every good physicist at the time, that he had bombarded it, and uranium acted like every other element that they had experienced, and it would move down to. Uranium would move down two to thorium, and then thorium would be radioactive and move down to, to radium, for which Marie Curie was the one who discovered radium. So, so excited was he with what he had accomplished by himself, without Lisa, 
in Berlin at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute that he decided to let the world know that this is what he had done and the products he had produced. He had bombarded uranium. It had moved down two to thorium and two to radium plus a side product of beryllium. And what does that look like on the chart? Well, uh, the chart I'll show you in a minute, but he was so excited he rushed to publish, to be the first in the world to explain this reaction that he had carried out. So he published it in one of the most prestigious physics journals in the world, Nature Wissenschaften, and, and uh, told the world that this is what he had done, produced thorium and radium. Meanwhile, November 9th and 10th, Kristallnacht occurred, in which the Nazis ran rampage across Europe, fired every German, uh, every Jewish German, everybody who is Jewish in Germany, and made life untenable, crashing windows, burning synagogues. It was the worst night ever in Europe with regard to the Nazis. And it was uh, obviously uh, fortunate that Lisa was out safely out of Germany, either in Sweden or in Copenhagen. So Lisa, knowing that this is going on in Germany, returns from Sweden to Copenhagen on November 10th. Now watch the dates very carefully. That's November 10th. November 13th, Han has some questions. He had already published his results of bombarding uranium and announcing the two products he got. But he has some misgivings. They, he and Lisa were in communication, and he decides not to tell his other lab mate, Fritz Strassmann, what he's going to do. And he gets on a train and meets Lisa in Copenhagen. She looks at his results of what he thinks he has produced, and she doesn't believe it. She says, Otto, that can't be right. That just cannot be right. You don't understand physics. <laughs> she doesn't believe Hans' <coughs> interpretation of what happened. And her words were, you have created a physicist nightmare. He didn't understand the physics of it. Two days later, Han returns on the train to Berlin. He never told his lab partner, Fritz Strassmann, that he had gone to see Lisa. Never said that he was gone. Now he's safely back for him, safely back in Germany. It's no understatement to say that upon his return, having spent some hours with Lisa in Copenhagen, he is totally perplexed. He doesn't know what the hell he produced. And he's embarrassed that he had published. And Lisa said that could not have happened. Shortly thereafter, in December, the next month, Lisa again travels back to Stockholm. And she's in Stockholm on December 10th for the convening of the Nobel Prize Committee. The Nobel Prize Committee, in their great wisdom, honoring physicists across the world, chose Enrico Fermi and bestow on him the Nobel Prize in 1938 for physics for producing two brand new elements, two trans-uranium elements that I showed you the equation of which, the, the elements above uranium, up one and then up another, up two. And he has claimed, although he didn't know what to name them, he wasn't sure of the properties, but he claimed he had produced two new elements above uranium. And Lisa, stateless, homeless, penniless, watches this proceeding of his co or her colleague traveling from Rome to Stockholm to receive the Nobel Prize. And she shakes her head. This 
just cannot be right. You should keep in mind that no, uh, Enrico Fermi, 38, is receiving this Nobel Prize for actually, we understand now, work he did not do, he did not understand. But he would eventually go to Chicago and be a part of the Manhattan Project. And uh, this all took place, if you remember, under the football stadium at the University of Chicago. So that's the Enrico Fermi we're talking about. But now back to Stockholm. <coughs> On December 21st, a letter arrives from Otto Hahn. And he tells her what he thinks he has achieved. And Lisa replies with a vehement objection that what you have done and what you have claimed to have done does not make sense. And we have those letters. They're in the historical record. We have the letters that she wrote back to him. That was December 21st. On December 22nd, Otto Hahn, in such a rush to claim credit for what he thought was this major breakthrough of producing two transuranic elements, as Enrico Fermi had done, that he again publishes his findings again, the second time, in the Nature Wissenschaften. And they accepted his, his, his paper and published it. The next day. That was December 22nd, published. December 23rd, in Copenhagen, her nephew, Otto Frisch, is in Copenhagen at the laboratory with Niels Bohr. Frisch leaves Copenhagen and goes to Kungalv, I guess that's how you pronounce it, Sweden, on December 23rd, 1938. And he and Lisa sit down together to try to figure out what, in fact, is the correct interpretation of the experiment that she had told Otto Hahn to do, and what would be the correct interpretation of that experiment that she suggested. Now, let's try to understand, and Kate, I'm going to try to go as slowly and carefully as possible <laughs> on this. We've got to go back now, and this is really the key. We've got to go back to 1905. This is 1938. We've got to go back to 1905 and what Lisa learned as a student in Vienna when Einstein published his paper of 1905 in Bern, Switzerland. And I'm going to take this really slowly with you. The protons in the nucleus of an element are held together with a binding energy. Something holds the protons together. There is, and this is what I, of what Einstein was aware. They're held together. And they're held together with a certain amount of energy. And that energy has been termed the binding energy, which holds the protons together. When the nucleus is broken apart, i.e., the protons thrown out, the neutrons thrown out, that binding energy will be released. According to the equation, E equals mc squared. So what does E equals mc squared mean? You take the mass, which is almost the same as the weight of a proton that's broken apart, right? It leaves, and Einstein postulated, he never did this. That's the genius. He postulated that when protons are broken apart, how much energy was held together, they're no longer held together, that energy is going to be released. It's no longer needed. It's released. Well, how much energy? Well, that's easy, according to Albert Einstein. You take the mass of the protons and multiply it times the square of the speed of light. That's how much energy is going to be released. I mean, everybody would say that, wouldn't they? 
E equals MC squared. You know, as kids, we all learned that. And we had no idea what the hell it meant. That's what it means. When protons are split apart, the binding energy which held them together is released. How much energy? Albert Einstein, Baron Switzerland, the patent office. He says it's E equals MC squared. Oh, that's easy to say. But C is the speed of light multiplied times itself, squared times the weight of the particles. That's a lot of energy. OK, so let's look at this a little more carefully so that you really appreciate the input. Because this conversation, which I'm having, to you, having with you right now, is essentially, so says David Bisno, essentially what Otto Frisch and Lisa Meitner discussed in Sweden. That is what they discussed on the shore of the water that cold winter in Sweden at the end of 1938 when they were together. So what we're saying is that the mass of the components, they add up the two protons and neutrons, the, the mass of the components is less than its total weight. In other words, part of the atom, the weight of the atom, is energy. But it appears as mass when they're together. Now, I was, yesterday I was sort of explaining, trying to explain this to Faye, and I thought I've got, I've got to really make this clear because this this is it's just counter counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense to most of us. So I came up with this example just yesterday. <laughs> I said to Faye, "How much does an apple weigh?" I, said, I, I don't know. How much does an orange weigh? Well, I, I don't know either. So Faye got out her kitchen scale, and we measured an apple. That apple, well, it's not that apple, but an apple that we picked out that Faye had just bought at the co-op weighs seven ounces. And an orange weighs eight ounces, well, roughly. OK? So the two together weigh 15 ounces. Now, if somehow we could, this is pure nonsense, but if somehow we could combine these two in an atomic reaction so they'd be together as one atom, think of them as protons. Each one is a proton or a neutron. And you put them together. This can't be done physically, but for illustration, we put them together and we put them in a bag. Now they're together, i.e., in the nucleus. And you weigh the bag, and the bag weighs nothing. But we weigh them. The bag weighs nothing. You'll find that the weight is 20 ounces. Now, does that make sense? It doesn't make sense. Nowhere in our real experience has an apple and an orange, you put them together, they weigh 15 ounces, you put them in the bag, which weighs nothing, and now it's 20 ounces. But that is the situation with protons and neutrons that, that are combined atomically into an element. The components, the components weigh less than the total amount combined. Just think of the bag and the apple and the orange. The bag weigh, it weighs more. How could that be? What is the difference? Where is that five grams? Where did that come from and where does it go? That extra five grams, you can measure it on a scale. Einstein tells us that's the binding energy. And when you take the apple and the orange out of the bag, the, that five grams is going to go out as energy. How much energy? Five grams times the square of the speed of light. A hell of a lot of energy. That's what Einstein's equation is all about. And that is what Otto Frisch and Lisa Meidner understood sitting together that winter in Stockholm, or outside of Stockholm, Kungalv, Sweden, wherever that is, trying to interpret what the hell her colleague had done with whom she worked for 31 years. So again. If the components of an atom are broken apart, 
their binding energy will be released. Are there any questions about this? Because this is really the key. Tom. Yeah, is there a, a trigger mechanism that uh, releases the energy? And if there is, what is it? Well, yeah, it, it, it's something that splits the atom. And in this case, it's the trigger of neutrons okay. bombarding in. And, and, and that is what's done. You send neutrons in, and that was known. What they didn't know is how to interpret the results. Fermi did this in Rome, 1934. Hahn did it in Berlin. They were, they were, quote, all doing this, but they didn't understand the results. And it didn't look as there was something fishy, so says Lisa Meitner, because Enrico Fermi claims the Nobel Prize and all the, they all bought it. And Otto Hahn publishes it twice in Nature Wissenschaften and claims it. And Lisa scratches her head and says, I don't think so. I don't think so with her. And she had in mind Einstein's E equals mc squared. Now let me give you, you know, I don't like to write words and numbers on the screen. I think that's. Oh, a question? If you take, I'm sorry. If you take a neutron from something yeah. to put it somewhere else, what happens to the thing you've taken it from? Does that change? Um, sorry. I, I can't answer. I, 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 it's a question. I, okay. I, 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 I don't. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it does change it. it the way you make. Yes, they knock neutrons out of the element that they hit, and so now it will be reduced in atomic um, weight. So if you hit boron 12 and knock a neutron out of it, now it'll be boron 11. I want you to all understand, this is the high risk that an ophthalmologist faces when he talks about <laughs> physics. But I, I appreciate a physicist being in the room. Uh, uh, thank, you, thank you very much. Now you understand the answer to your question. Ab ab absolutely. OK. So I don't like to put words, numbers on a screen. I think that's bad teaching. But just a second, you don't have to, just a, a, a few minutes of really bad teaching. Because I don't like you have to read something on the screen. But here's an example, a real life example. If you weigh the weight of two protons, take helium, an atom of helium. If you add the weight of two protons and two electrons, you get, what, 2.015 atomic mass units, is what it's called. And you add the weight of two neutrons, the weight of those two components, this is the real weight, is 4.03 atomic units. But the measured mass of helium, the bag with the apple and the orange in it, is more. It's the apple and the orange in the bag. This is more than the weight of the particles. And that amount of mass, atomic mass units, times the square of the speed of light, is what we're talking about, is going to be released. So this is just a real hands-on example of weight of what we're talking about. Any another question? OK. So now, let us, for appreciation of what this means, we produce energy all the time. You heat your house. You're going to go home, and your home is going to be warmer. And what's happening in all our homes is we are burning something. We're burning a log or we're burning propane, or we're burning heating oil. And in every one of those cases, whether it's a burning log, propane, or heating oil, or I don't know what else is around that people use to, to keep warm, what's happening in our homes is a chemical reaction. Carbon is being burned, whether it's methane, propane, cellulose, a log, wood, 
and it's forming carbon, carbon dioxide combines with oxygen. It's a chemical reaction, and heat is released. That's why we burn it. That's what burning means, is we create a chemical reaction. And a chemical reaction, many of them, most of them, are what we call exothermic, and they produce heat. That's what we do every day, keeping our house warm, is a chemical reaction. None of us in our homes, as far as I know, have a nuclear reactor to keep warm. We could, but we don't. And so let's compare the amount of heat produced with a chemical reaction with the amount of heat produced by a nuclear reaction. So I have these two examples. Instead of propane, I take methane. It's another gas, carbon, oxygen. And we combine methane with oxygen. That's what we do when we burn. That's what burning is. And we combine methane with oxygen, and we form carbon dioxide and water. That's what happens when we burn something, whether it's heating oil or propane, methane, piece of newspaper. And it produces heat. So if we take, as an example, 16 grams of methane, you could take propane, take any, whatever you want, and however many grams. But I just took 16 grams of methane and burn it. It will produce 211 kilocalories. OK? And that's from 16 grams of methane in a chemical reaction. Now, as a comparison, let's go in that room, and we're going to take not 16 grams of methane, but 7 grams of an element, lithium. And we're going to do a t an atomic reaction. And we're going to bombard lithium with the hydrogen atom. And what does happens there? It doesn't produce water and carbon dioxide. It produces helium. That's <coughs> alchemy. We have changed the element from one thing to another. We made gold from tin. And when we do that with 7 grams rather than 16 grams, instead of 211 calories, we'll produce 23 million calories, as an example. That is the mega difference, an example of between a chemical reaction, which we're all going home and enjoying, but not thinking about, versus a nuclear reaction. And so those of us, Iliad members, whom we know, who are nuclear engineers, are all saying, you got to use nuclear energy. You're, you're wasting your time burning coal. Because look at the difference in the amount of heat produced if we split the atom and understand what Einstein told us. Split the atom, and you'll get a lot of energy. Are we OK with my explanation? OK. So this is the kind of stuff, for sure, that Lisa Meitner was sitting on the shore of the water in Stockholm, in, in Kungolf, with her nephew Otto Frisch thinking, Jesus. What did Otto Frisch do? What really happened in Berlin with the experiment, the procedure, the reaction that I told him to carry out? So there they are in Sweden, December 23rd, 1938, wondering what in fact happened in Berlin to the reaction. And this is the, the equation. Uranium bombarded by a neutron. What did it produce? What is the real explanation? They conclude, the two of them sitting together in Sweden, while the rest of the world is worried about the Nazis taking over Europe. This is December 1938. This is bad times. Concentration camps are being set up all over Europe. Franklin Roosevelt is being urged to get into the Second World War. 
These two sitting there together decide this is not what happened. This is not what Otto Hahn claimed to have done and published twice. Well then, what did happen? They're sitting together, no laboratory, sitting with a piece of paper and a pencil up in Sweden, figuring out what the hell did happen. And what they conclude is that it didn't, uranium didn't move down two or up one. Uranium split into two chunks, not just radiation down two, but the reaction that I told Otto Hahn to do split the uranium atom. And for sure, it produced two, two products, krypton, atomic um, uh, uh, number 36, and barium 56, which would add up to 92, a split. Now you have two brand new elements, not down to, but a split. And in fact, they calculate the energy that's going to come out, just as I showed you with an atomic reaction. And then they further figured in Sweden that not only had Otto Hahn split uranium into krypton and barium with the production of energy, but there were other reactions, other products of the split, which included all of these. Because sending a neutron into uranium is going to cause it to split like a, taking a dish and cracking it on the floor. It's not going to just be in two pieces. It's going to be in a number of pieces. All of those pieces put together will come back to uranium or make up what was uranium. And so this, these are the equations. You'll notice that in every one of them, the number of pairs, in each pair, the number of protons equals 92. No surprise. 92 has been split into these elements. And you notice, in addition, this is really key to watch or see. Oh, OK, we split it, two pieces, and a lot of different pieces. They all up to 92 and energy. But what's the kicker? They, this is one neutron, for argument, one neutron. And in each of these reactions, you got two products, huge energy, and three neutrons. Three, which are ready to go back and bombard more uranium. There is the essence of a sustained nuclear reaction. It is producing more fuel than that with which it was started. You started with one neutron, which is the fuel. And the products produce more fuel for further reactions. And that reaction, I'm skipping ahead now, that production of neutrons is what Enrico Fermi took to Chicago. And under the football stadium in Chicago in 1942, he bombarded and carried out the first what they call sustained nuclear reaction. It'll keep going. There's the bomb. So you see, if you understand what's going on here, this has all the makings because of the production of more fuel that will feed back into more uranium. So you have to have a critical amount of uranium, bombard it, and you've got what Enrico Fermi would later find, 1942 in Chicago, a sustained nuclear reaction. OK, so this is what ha uh, Lisa Meitner and Otto Frisch worked out on, in Kungal, Sweden. And looking on the chart, this is how you would diagram it. You take my colors, and you see their pairs. There are four pairs, if not more. 
of these pairs, all of which, when you take the products and add them to the protons together, they equal 92. Any questions on? OK. So this is what they decided must have happened in her laboratory back in Berlin. So there they are. But they came to the realization, as I've tried to depict here, that because of the production of neutrons, we have the making of an atomic bomb, which horrified them. Nobody in the history of the world had ever understood that this was possible, that you could break it into big pieces with the production of energy, which was described by Einstein 33 years prior. It's just the story is hard to believe that, that this is what happened. Uh, OK, so they were so. I don't know. I really don't know whether they were excited or concerned. or, uh, But it, this was big news in the physics world. And this would change the world with what they concluded. And Otto Frisch had worked with Niels Bohr. The only people who understood this, what had happened, are Frisch, Meitner, and they shared it with their colleague, Niels Bohr, who was right across the water in Copenhagen. Now, the story continues. Niels Bohr, just at that time, just after that, made plans to come to the United States and get out of Europe, get away from the Nazis. And he got on this ship, the SS Drottingholm, with a Belgian physicist by the name of Leon Rosenfeld, who was glad, as a Jew, to leave Europe. And they were together on this ship going to New York. And Niels Bohr could not help himself. And over wine or dinner or, or, or playing shuffleboard or I don't know what, <laughs> on the boat, he couldn't, sh he wanted, he, sh he shared the excitement of Lisa Meitner's discovery with a fellow physicist. Up until that time, the only three people who knew were Bohr, Frisch, and Meitner. But he shared it with this fellow, Leon Rosenfeld. OK, so they get to New York. Niels Bohr goes on his way. And where does Leon Rosenfeld go? Well, they hadn't landed. February 11th, Lisa and Frisch publish in Nature their findings of the split fission of the uranium atom. First time ever described in the world nuclear fission. She had discovered nuclear fission. Leon Rosenfeld lands in New York and takes the train to Princeton. Duh. And what do you think he did at Princeton? He gets up in a classroom with a blackboard and explains essentially the whole world listening because the newspapers, the next day was on the New York Times. He tells the world what. <laughs> Niels Bohr had shared with them over a dinner or a cocktail or something on the boat on the way over. And so now, boom, the whole world knows of the split of the uranium atom and the potential, the real release of energy. So then the story continues. Not very long after, the United States is now aware of what's happening in Germany. And Franklin Roosevelt is urged to call these people together. Leo Zillard on your left, Albert Einstein, Enrico Fermi from Rome, and a young brash scientist by the name of Edward Teller. And they together formed the Manhattan Project. That early, following Lisa Meitner and Otto Frisch in Sweden. Following the war, 1945 in Sweden, now the Nobel Committee has to decide who's going to get the Nobel Prizes. And the biggest discovery in the past years is the discovery of nuclear fission. And so they now have a discussion in Sweden. And all this can be read. This is all documented of to whom to give the Nobel Prize for physics. And they discuss 
Otto Hahn, and they discuss Lisa Meitner. Well, they decide that really it was Otto Hahn who did the experiment, although he had no idea what he had produced, and it wasn't his idea to do that experiment. It was only in the interpretation by Lisa Meitner. And so the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery of nuclear fission was given to Otto Hahn in 1945 for chemistry. But it wasn't a chemical reaction. It was a physics reaction of which he did not understand anything. He had never been trained in nuclear physics. He understood how to separate compounds as, as chemistry. If you now go back, which you can easily do on your computer, and type in Nobel acceptance speech by Otto Hahn at the Nobel meeting in 1945, he gives a very nice speech accepting the award with no mention, not one word mention, of Lisa Meitner in his acceptance speech, as if she never existed. She was invited after the war to come to the United States. She accepted Harry Truman's invitation. She had lunch or dinner with Harry Truman. She met with students at Bryn Mawr. She was offered professorships in a number of institutions, Caltech, Berkeley, MIT. She refused all of them, went back to England, uh, moved to a small country town not too far from Cambridge, England and would die in 1968. Uh, and the story had never been told. So now, let me tell you a Dartmouth story and why David and Faye Bisno know this story. I was here, I moved here in 1993. I moved here in 93, and I learned there was such a thing as a farmer's market over in Norwich. So I had also met, because I was doing some history of science classes for Iliad, and I had met the former provost of Dartmouth and a physics professor by the name of Leonard Reeser. Anna, did, you must have known him? Very well. Very well. Yeah, you were good friends with Leonard. OK. And so I had met Leonard Reeser. Uh, I forget for what, I, somehow I met him because I was doing history of science stuff. And I remember exactly, this was the summer of 1996, so what is that, uh, 20, 26 years ago. I was buying fresh corn <laughs> at the farmer's market. And this little guy, Leonard Reeser, walks up to me. And who's Leonard Reeser? Let me show you a picture. This is Leonard Reeser. Physics professor emeritus at Dartmouth, emeritus provost of Dartmouth, who was the foremost exponent among the concerned atomic physicists of the doomsday clock and warning people how close we were to a nuclear reaction going off and that we need to turn our attention to the control of nuclear weapons. He walks up to me. I'm buying corn. And he says, David, there's a new book out on Lisa Meitner. I said, who's Lisa Meitner? There weren't very, very few people knew the name Lisa Meitner. Am I correct in that? Very few people knew the name Lisa Meitner. He said, you got to read the book. So when, you know, when certain people tell you to do something, you do it. So. <laughs> When Lisa might, I mean, when Leonard Reeser tells you to do something, you should do it. So I go out and I get the book. The book is Lisa Meitner. Here's the book. Lisa Meitner by some author, Ruth Syme, published, just published, in 1996. And Leonard Reeser had already read it and sharing with me the fact that I should read it as I'm buying corn at, at the farmer's market. So I went home to my house in Norwich, and I got hold of this book. And I sit down and read the book, and I couldn't put it down. Oh my god, this story, which is essentially an expanded edition of what I've just told you. OK, more details. And I 
heartily recommend you read this book. And when Ruth includes chemical reactions, just forget it. Just skip over it. The, the story's fine. You don't need, because she's writing for everybody. She's writing for physicists. She's writing for chemists. And she's writing for the lay public. And you just skip over the equations, and, and you're fine. And so I said, wow, what a story. This is perfect for an Iliad class. Just This is the kind of stuff I love to do. This is perfect. Then I scratched my head, and I said, who's Ruth Syme? I never heard of her. Nobody's heard of Ruth Syme. So it says on the back leaf of the book that she teaches chemistry at Sacramento State University in California. And I said, Sacramento State, that's not exactly the world's leading research institute. <laughs> uh, I said, but I got I to gotta call her. And as some of you know, I'm not bashful calling anybody. <laughs> so I dial Sacramento, get the State University, ask for the chemistry department, and ask to, to speak with Ruth Sign, Professor Sign. So pretty soon, hello. And I said, Professor Syme, let me try to introduce myself. I'm a retired eye doctor up in Hanover, New Hampshire, yada, 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 and the lifelong learning. And I've just finished your book. Oh, she said, oh, so good for you to read it. And, uh, and um, she said, well, tell me about yourself. I said, well, I'm from St. Louis, and I became an eye doctor, and, and I went to Harvard for four years before medical school. She said, oh, you were at Harvard? I said, yeah, well, she, well so was I. And, and she said, uh, what courses did you take? I said, well, I took Chem 1 from Professor Rockow in organic chemistry from, she said, oh, you took Professor Rockow's course in Chem 1. Well, I was the lab instructor <laughs> in Chem 1 the year you were there. And I was your lab instructor, because I was a graduate student earning my PhD. So I said, oh, my goodness. And here she is, as a lab instructor, <laughs> in 1958. We were together in the same room. <laughs> so I said, um, Professor Syme, it's been so long since I learned a little bit of nuclear chemistry. Uh, I did learn a little bit, but not very much. And it's been a long time ago, 40, 40 plus years ago or so. I said, if I came to California, which we do, we go to Santa Barbara. Uh, could she said, you come to Sacramento, you stay with us, and each afternoon we'll sit down and I'll refresh your nuclear chemistry. <laughs> so I did. So I flew out to Sacramento, and I met her, a lovely woman, and, and uh, her husband. And she teaches, uh, and, and she suffered somewhat the same as Lisa Meitner, because when she finished Harvard PhD, she had a really tough time finding a job as a woman. Just like Lisa Meitner, nobody would pay her. She was not only Jewish, she was a woman. And nobody would hire her. Max Planck didn't hire her. He said, you come work here. But her, Lisa Meitner's father had to support Lisa in Berlin. Well, Ruth was married, and she wanted to find a position where both she and her husband could teach. And anyway. She ends up in Sacramento. It's not MIT. It's not Caltech. It's not Harvard or Dartmouth. It's Sacramento State. And I said, well, how do you like teaching at Sacramento State? And she said, you know, I love it. These kids come from normal backgrounds. A lot of them are blue-collar families. They've never heard of chemistry. And it's a delight to teach these kids and open up their eyes to the beauty of chemistry. Anyway, so we sit down, and she tutors me on nuclear chemistry. And then, uh, Barb, you rem may remember, I did this class as an eight-week course back in 97. So I had previously done a course on Charles Darwin and invited the author, who was in England, to come to Dartmouth, which he did. He flew from Cambridge, England, to, Har to Boston and took the plane up. And we met him out at the airport in a driving snowstorm. And everybody loved meeting the author of the book. So I said, well, if it's good enough for Charles Darwin, it's good enough for Ruth Syme. I said, Ruth, would you come and meet my class? So she said, I'd love to. I'd love to come back to the East Coast. So she, just like Jim Moore from England, Ruth flew to Boston, Dartmouth. I arranged, at that time, there was a Harvard club of the Upper Valley, Tom Campion, 
You remember Tom and Nardi? Well, he formed a Harvard club, and Ruth spoke to the Harvard club of the Upper Valley. She met with my Iliad class, and we've been friends ever since. And here she is at Dartmouth signing books, and everybody in the class bought her book. And we're thrilled that the author would sign this book. Now, her book, Lisa Meitner, is the book which has the complete history that I've told you. There are other books since that are not this. Ruth spent 20 years writing this book, flying back and forth to Berlin, to Copenhagen, the Frisch family, uh, Niels Bohr, to Copenhagen, et cetera. She did an absolutely thorough, every pebble examined to tell the complete story, just a summary, quick thing of which I've told you. So it sort of started with Leonard Reeser, and it ends up here. But one more little tidbit about this whole story. At the time I was doing this, the president of Iliad was a woman by the name of Mid Davison. Mm -hmm. Any of you know her? OK. So Mid Davison was the president of, president of, of Iliad. Her husband was an orthopedic surgeon. He would teach it as a retiree at the medical school. She was wonderful. And she came to my class. And she met Ruth Syme. And as a hobby, Mid Davison was an artist. She would paint, right? Yeah. She would paint. And she was to so taken with this, the story that I've shared with you and meeting Ruth Syme that she went home and did a portrait of what she thought Lisa Meitner might look like. And she sent it in to Physics Today. And they published Mid Davison's portrait she did here in Hanover of Lisa Meitner on the front cover of this physics journal, which went out to physicists all across the world. So that's where my story ends, which is sort of a nice wrap up to, I think, an amazing story. And Kate Hewitt, I hope I wasn't too scientific. <laughs> OK. So um, we're, we're plenty early to get out of here before we're inundated with undergraduates. It's quarter after 11. Uh, Sven. Since we're, you're performing here in the middle of Dartmouth campus, where does J John Kemeny fit into this Ma Manhattan, Manhattan Project scenario? I, he was only a 17-year-old freshman at Princeton when he went to Los Alamos to join some hmm, nuclear physicist out there and work on this project. Do you know any of that background? I, well, I, I, no, I don't know that, but I can tell you, you remind me of one tidbit. I meet Leonard Reeser, right? Did you know Leonard Reeser? No. I, OK. So I meet Leonard Reeser. And I'm not a researcher. I've never done any research, medical or otherwise. It's just not my thing. But in spending some hours with Leonard Reeser, he taught me the beauty and the excitement of doing basic research, understanding the beauty of how our world is put together. And I've never seen a gentleman or a woman glow so much as Leonard Reeser, when explaining this whole story, he was right there doing this. And I said, so what part did you play in this story? He said, "My, I was at the University of Chicago earning my PhD in physics when Enrico Fermi, Edward Teller, all moved out to Los Alamos. And somehow he had met Edward Teller. And Edward Teller and his wife invited Leonard Reeser and his young wife, they were graduate students, to go to Los Alamos and be their babysitter. <laughs> so Leonard Reeser was Edward Teller's babysitter in Los Alamos. <laughs> Kemeny, I can't tell you. I, although, I, I mean, I'm not a really Dartmouth undergraduate grad. Uh, so I wasn't here when he was doing his, but I understand he was one of the fathers of computers and, and, and a real hero. And David Shribman has nothing but wonderful things to say 
about John Kennedy, and so does everybody else who knew him. But I don't know that he has any part of this story. Sorry on that. But Leonard Reeser did, and he was the babysitter out in Los Alamos. <laughs> Jenny. Well, thank you. It feels good to be here again. Uh, and, and uh, you know, if I can do it live on the Dartmouth campus, I'll do it. Yeah? I think you said at the beginning that Lisa was from a big family. She, had, she was one of eight. Then what happened to the rest? Do you know? Okay. Uh, I can tell you, two sisters, both earned PhDs. They were a highly academic, educated family. Uh, you can... You can now Google Lisa Meitner. There's tons of it to, to read. Uh, I can't tell you about all the siblings. I can tell you of two. They earned, I don't know where they went, what they did, but you can look them up now. Did they survive the Holocaust? I think so, but I don't have the details. I, I really don't. Um, but if you write me, David Bis davidbisno at gmail.com, is that right? Yeah. David Bisno, Gmail, it's easy. One word, David Bisno, gmail.com. I'll send you a Ruth Symes email. And you can write Ruth, and she'd love to hear from you. She would absolutely love it. Yeah. Where does your ever curious mind take you next? Yeah. Where, where, where did, I didn't hear you. Where does your ever curious mind take you next? What's our next lecture? Oh. <laughs> Well, I, okay, uh, that's, that's a fair enough question. I haven't done anything for almost three years because I uh, just took a break. Um, but prior, three years ago, I think it was, I did a course called, or a lecture called, Is This How Fascism? I did it in this room. Yeah. Is This How Fascism Comes to America? Yeah. I remember. And Joe Medlicott was sitting just about where you're sitting right now. And Joe said, David, you really need to read this book by Sinclair Lewis. It can't happen here. So I went out and got that book. It takes place in Vermont. And I was stunned. One, at my ignorance of not knowing about the book. And two, stunned at the story that Sinclair Lewis weaves of a reflection of exactly what's going on here. So Madeleine Albright had already also written a book about fascism. And so I put that all together and did a talk entitled, Is This How Fascism Comes to America? Mm -hmm. Well, now it's been three years. There have been additional books written. And look what's happened to the world. Not only Britain, but Italy, Hungary, on and on. It's pretty yeah, horrible. United States. Yeah, in the United, yeah, in the United States. And, and, and so I... When we leave and go to Santa Barbara for the winter, I'm going to try to turn my attention to updating that talk. I haven't decided what to call it yet, but something about authoritarianism and fascism, et cetera. And none of it's good news. It's really frightening. So that's my, and the Supreme Court. Oh, yeah. But, you know, that, the Supreme Court's pretty much on, on the headlines, and people know what's going on. And, and uh, there's no good news there either, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, but I'm willing to tell the story. So we'll see. But between fascism, authoritarianism, and the Supreme Court. Are there any mysteries about the story of what Lisa Meitner, the, have we got it? It's OK? Well, thank you very much. Have a good weekend. <laughs>